All right. Uh, thank you so much for being patient, everyone. Uh, we are now uh, about to begin. So first of all, uh, as some of you may know, my name is Mr. Shabazz. Um, I am the Black Student Union Advisor, uh, as well as the Chair of the Black History Month Committee. Um, I want to just welcome you all to our uh, annual Black Box Lecture Series. And this is designed to ensure that unlike in a large auditorium setting where we will basically be presenting information and you would just receive it, um, we always envision the Black Box Lecture Series to be more interactive and intimate so that we could really, really um, understand, extend, and refine whatever information is being presented. So today, we have a very special presentation by the Black Student Union that is going to require you um, and your thoughts and your reactions. So this is going to be very interactive and uh, very interesting. Uh, so just keep an open mind. Um, you want to keep your mind open and certainly your hearts ready to receive uh, the, the information that we have for you. So again, uh, at this time, I'm going to turn it over to the hands of our very capable and uh, excellent Madam President Miracle Gross, who will be hosting today's Back in Black seminar. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here with us this morning. We really appreciate it. And I just wanted to say thank you to all the teachers who took time out of their class today to come be here with us today. I would also like to present my enlightenment team. Hi, I'm Amna from Sheldon, and I'm the junior class representative of BSU. Um, hey guys, my name is Basmala Elgamal, and I'm SGA representative for BSU. And they will be helping me present today. So this is our Back in Black Film Festival and Talk Back, so welcome. So what is the purpose of this talk back? We are holding this seminar to deconstruct themes associated with the way black people have been depicted in film, and furthermore, to encourage discussion regarding social issues that affect black mental health. So if you did not know, this year's theme for Black History Month is black health and wellness. So we pick themes that affect, or I'm sorry, that depict social issues that affect black mental health as that correlates to the theme, and for Alexandria City High School, our additional theme for Black History Month is celebrating black art, and what better way to celebrate art than through film. So we encourage everyone to keep an open mind during these videos, as many of them highlight social issues that affect the black family, and they're rarely discussed. We also encourage engagement with the audience, so this is a safe space. Feel free to ask questions and like answer questions. Today we will be watching films from like clips from Hidden Figures, Malcolm X, and All America. So we're gonna start with Hidden Figures. How many people have seen this movie? Just raise your hand. Awesome. So Hidden Figures is a film about three brilliant African-American women at NASA, Katherine Johnson, Dorothy Vaughn, and Mary Jackson, who serve as the brains behind one of the greatest operations in history, the launch of astronaut John Glenn into orbit, a stunning achievement that restored the nation's confidence, turned around the space race, and galvanized the world. So the clip we will be watching is of Taraji P. Henson, who plays Katherine Johnson in this film and how she was treated in the workplace. Paul, what's happening here? Mr. Harrison, I would like to attend today's briefing. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Well, sir, the data changes so fast. The capsule changes, the weight and the landing zones are all changing every day. I do my work, you attend these briefings. I have to start over. Colonel Glenn launches in a few weeks. We don't have the math figured out yet. Why is it she can't attend? Because she doesn't have clearance, Al. I cannot do my work effectively if I do not have all of the data and all of the information as soon as it's available. I need to be in that room hearing what you hear. Pentagon briefings are not for civilians. It requires the highest clearance. I feel like I'm the best person to present my calculations. No, no, let this go, No, I am not. And, and she is a woman. There is no protocol for a woman Okay, I get meetings. that part, Paul. But within these walls, who, uh, who makes the rules? You, sir, you are the boss. You just have to act like one, sir.
Where the hell have you been? Everywhere I look, you're not where I need you to be. It's not my imagination. Now, where the hell do you go every day? To the bathroom, sir. To the bathroom. To the damn bathroom. For 40 minutes a day? What are you doing there? We're T minus zero here. I put a lot of faith in you. There's no bathroom for me here. What do you mean there's no bathroom for you there here? There is no bathroom. There are no colored bathrooms in this building or any building outside the West Campus, which is half a mile away. Did you know that? I have to walk to Timbuktu just to relieve myself. And I can't use one of the handy bikes. Picture that, Mr. Harrison. My uniform, skirt below my knees, my heels, and a simple string of pearls. Well, I don't own pearls. Lord knows you don't pay colors enough to afford pearls. And I work like a dog, day and night, living off a of coffee from a pot none of you want to touch. Excuse me, if I have to go to the restroom a few times a day. Plain old toilets. Go wherever you damn well please. Preferably closer to your desk. What the? So we're gonna move into our discussion questions regarding those films. So the first question that we have, well, some background. Katherine G. Johnson, played by Taraji P. Henson, was a highly educated and intelligent black woman. In fact, her calculations were critical to the success of the first U.S. crewed space flights. Were you surprised that even with her constant displays of excellence, she still faced discrimination? Why or why not? No, I was not. And the reason why I can say this um, for myself as a black woman and growing up um, in the 80s and 90s, you always had to put an extra 100% to prove you were just as good. I mean, I saw so many things when I saw that film, one, that there's no clearance for women. And if it weren't for women like Katherine Johnson, you know, being recognized, because I didn't even know about this story until the film came out. So I saw so many things that hit me, like, she had to go to a separate bathroom. And I had parents who actually lived through segregation. My parents went to an all black high school. There were no white people in the school at all, not one. I went through my parents' yearbook, not one white person. Um, so my grandparents telling me things like going to even amusement parks and blacks were only allowed to go one day a year, which was Labor Day. So I saw so many things that I've seen my parents you know, live through and grandparents and talk about. And I'm not surprised that she had to continue to basically voice herself. But as she voiced herself, I saw the 
other person seeing her as angry or agitated. He, they, her supervisor said, you're not going to let this go. And she's like, no, I'm not. Because it was her work that they were going in that boardroom and using. And if you saw the next clip, when they got in there and were asked questions, they had no clue. And she basically had to save them and give them the answers they were looking for. Thank you, Ms. Chavis. Anyone else? The first time I saw the commercial to Hidden Figures, I fell out crying because I'm a mathematician. I studied math for years. I studied the history of mathematics, and nobody never told me about these women. And I'm over a half a century, so I've been on this earth a long time. And to have never heard the story and to just see it because I had to be bused from my community to another community to go to school once they found out I had the aptitude for math. So all of my friends went to different high schools. I was bused and sent someplace else to go to high school. And when I went to college, I had to take the train every day for two hours out of my neighborhood to the other side of the city to go learn. And when I see that room, that's how it was for me in college. I was the only person that looked like me, the only woman there. And when I began working in the math field, I would do the work and get downgraded on my evaluations. And then someone else of a nationality would take my work and submit it. And they would be applauded for my work and I would not get acknowledgement for it. So. It's not as bad now, but it still exists that women in the workforce oftentimes are not heard. And you have to push further and show you really know your stuff and show you really got your stuff before people listen to you. Um. Well, we don't have to go any further than right here. So most of you guys know that I am half of the theater department here. And my colleague is Ms. Bachman. And um, she's a Caucasian woman, and I am an African-American woman. And for years, people used to come up and say, oh, this was so nice, uh, what Ms. Bachman did. She directed such a very good show. Well, the show they saw was the show that I directed. And this has happened to me for years in this building and the old building. Until finally, I did a show, uh, it was Chicago, because it took that long. This is way before most of y'all were even here. Um, and I'm talking including my colleagues. So it took me until directing a show called Chicago where everybody seriously knew that I was the one who directed that show for me as an African-American woman to get what was due mine. I directed that show. I put in the blood, uh, blood, sweat, and tears. And of course, I had a team of colleagues who helped me. But it wasn't until that show. Then I was slapped in the face again in front of the whole faculty where my colleague, again, was acknowledged for directing the Laramie Project. And I directed that show. So over and over again, even my colleague, who I love dearly, we, we've been a partnership for 18 years, we've had this discussion many times, she gets credit for things that I do. So it happens everywhere. Thank you, Ms. Jones. I think this really just displays the lack of acknowledgement, acknowledgement that black women receive in and outside of the workplace. Does anyone ha else have anything before we move on to the second? Okay. Well, well, um, well before we do that, 
um, I was, you know, trying to uh, pause because uh, I definitely want, you know, the, the studio audience, um, you know, to, to be engaged and, and to give your thoughts because this, this seminar is interactive and it's about all of us processing uh, this, this very, very uh, deep material. But what I will say to, directly to the question, uh, it talks about, it asks the question, were you surprised that even with her constant displays of excellence, she still faced discrimination? Let's be clear that, uh, number one, no, I'm not surprised, but the reason why I'm not surprised is because discrimination isn't actually about excellence at all. Racism is a systematic oppression of certain groups, and it bestows favors upon other groups. So when you look at a nation's institutions and laws, that will tell you uh, who that particular, who or what that particular nation represents. So beyond uh, the flowery words in the Declaration of Independence, beyond uh, the uh, Due Process Clause and the Equal Protection Clause in the 14th Amendment, let's be clear that our laws are not about excellence. They are about racism. So when you look at it that way, the intersectionality of race and gender um, really does uh, marginalize black women even more than, than black men, because you actually are dealing with two things that the, uh, based the dominant culture, particularly uh, white male culture, uh, really does in fact marginalize. So when you take a look at it, no, I'm not surprised because uh, excellence, we've always been excellent. Um, ever since we were kidnapped uh, on the shores of West Africa and brought here, we've been excellent. We've been the capital. We were the intellectual driving force behind the creation of this nation. And uh, we actually also, through the blood of the slaughtered, really made this nation work. Because again, we had the intellectual know-how, we, knew we know how to farm, uh, we had specific skill sets that they did not have in Europe because the climate or the land did not really lend itself to you learning how to grow things that will not grow there. So, no, I'm not surprised because, again, excellence is not about discrimination, and discrimination isn't about excellence. They're in two different categories. This is racism is what it is, and gender bias as well. Thank you, Mr. Shabazz. That was a great bridge into our next question. Um, these scenes do a good job of displaying intersectionality, as Mr. Just, Mr. Shabazz was describing. In the case of these two scenes, the intersections of being black and also being a woman. So do you think that Katherine Johnson's race and gender played a role in how she was treated and why? <laughs> Once again, you're encouraged to engage. Safe space. Um, <clears throat> um, I would say that it was, it did play a really big role because back then they all saw black women as uh, lesser than them. They saw anyone, anything black lesser. And the fact that she was not even the key, like she was the mastermind behind John Glenn getting up in the rocket was just... It's kind of mind-boggling because it's like, how do you treat somebody this bad? And they're the ones just like doing all the hard work that you're getting the credit for. It's, it's just sad, really. I was going to say that, you know, like back then they thought that black people or black women, of course, were overall like, um, like dirty. I'm just gonna be real. Thought you know that were that you know they were dirty and felt like, well, they would try anything to keep us down to keep you down from like thinking that you're smart. If they felt like they felt like they were threatened by saying how smart you were, so they felt like, oh yeah, well, she's doing more work than us. She's smarter than us. We need to put her down because you know like that's not how it's supposed to be, or at least that's what they think. You know that we're not supposed to be smarter than them. Um, just because of our skin and, yeah. Um, I definitely think that uh, 
the way she was treated, um, attributed to her race and gender, because for like all of American history, women were really um, like not expected to kind of like be on the same plane as men when it comes to like occupation. And so I feel like all of those factors together, you know, her um, already kind of like defying standards by learning and educating herself and putting herself in the role of, you know, like being a mathematician in <clears throat> like such a male dominated area um, really uh, kind of just like it, it attributed to how she was treated. Um, and of course, race as well, you know, but I feel like those two together kind of really put her in a tough spot. And so she did have to try um, a lot more, a lot harder than um, even maybe just like some of the, the women in the area. And a lot of the women um, were employed as like secretaries, you know? And so I feel like even just thinking about that, just like there's so much courage in getting up to the place of like a NASA mathematician, like that's crazy, you know? Um, so yeah, I do think that race and gender played a role. Um, while watching the movie, um, there, like, you notice that the whole NASA math thing, the program itself was heavily male dominated, white male dominated. The women had a separate area, black women had a separate area. Even when it came to the white women's interaction with the black women, it was different. They were the pets, even though the black women were way ahead of them in terms of education and expert, well, not expertise since they weren't able to work, but in terms of knowledge, they were way ahead. So I think her gender affected how she was treated as, um, and that went along with her race also because of her and the environment she was in. It was probably weird for both sides to be like, oh, we're like the white, the white men were like, oh, we're dominating, we're we're the head of this field, we're the smartest of this field, we're the only one who could do this. And then a black woman comes in and is like, oh my God, I'm not at the top anymore. Or at least I wanna think that I'm at the top anymore, so I'm gonna treat her this way so that she can get like um, this courage to continue on. Yeah. Um, um. I, hello? Um, my bad. So I do think it played a role like the gender and the race, but what I think is like kind of sad is like it took her like, she was yelling at the top of her lungs so they understood like what was happening to her or like so she could get her point across because nobody would listen. And it's like she did it like multiple days and it's like he decided to like yell at her without, I mean like I understand why he did kind of, but like it's kind of sad that like it took her that, like it took her that much like I guess energy to like explain how she felt and like later he like said no colored bathrooms or whatever, but it's just sad. Um, I was gonna say, with, even with all that being true, in the end, after they got the technology of the IBM computer, which um, Dorothy Vaughn got to work because the other people had no idea what they were doing. They didn't even have the measurements to get it in the room. Before Glenn launched, the last thing he said check my numbers, go find the girl. Not woman, but the girl. And in the end, she checked the, um, the numbers before he launched into space. So he didn't trust the computer, he didn't trust the department, he trusted her mathematics. And so that's another thing, you know, that you need to understand, that even with all of that, the race and gender, while they still kept her down, they still needed her at the end before he launched into space. Thank you, Mr. Uh, one, one quick thing that I wanted to add, you know, you, um, one of our participants really triggered something when she, you know, really screamed to, to get her point across in frustration. And that reminds me of something that Intazake Shange uh, once shared. She said, somebody, anybody seen 
a black girl song. She's been dead so long, closed in silence, so long she doesn't know the sound of her own voice, her infinite beauty. Sing the song of her possibilities. Sing a righteous gospel. Let her be born, let her be born and handled warmly. Clearly, she was not being, as well as all the black women, were not being handled warmly. And this, again, goes back to the intersectionality of race and gender and how, again, black women are often closed in silence. So she screamed to get her point across, and I believe that it worked. And then to feed off what Mr. Shabazz said is ironic because we were just talking about two days ago how black women in the workplace, you have to come in and kind of be a dominant force to get your point across and you have to almost come across as angry because if you don't, then you may be depicted as lazy or you know not capable of working. And um, as one of our participants pointed out that even the white secretaries in the movie, if you've watched the movie, even though they were not doing any mathematical work, they were still shown more appreciation and uplifting than Katherine Johnson, whose calculations actually contributed to the first U.S. crewed space flight. So, um, yes, I thought that was interesting. Thank y'all for talking. This is very insightful. We're going to move on to our second film clip. So we have Malcolm X. Has anyone seen this movie? Anyone heard of it? Okay. So a tribute to black activist and leader of the struggle for black liberation, Malcolm X hit bottom during his imprisonment in the 50s. He became a black Muslim and then a leader in the nation of Islam. His assassination in 1965 left a legacy of self-determination and racial pride. Did you ever look up the word black in a dictionary? For what? Did you ever study anything that wasn't part of some con? What the hell for, man? Come with me. Black, destitute of light, devoid of color, enveloped in darkness, hence utterly dismal or gloomy, as the future looked black. Pretty good with them words, ain't you? Soiled with dirt, foul, sullen. Hostile, forbidding, as a black day. Foully or outrageously wicked, as black cruelty. Indicating disgrace, dishonor, or culpability. And there's others. Black male, black ball, black guard. Yeah, well, there's some more, right? Let's look up white. Here. Read. White, of the color of pure snow, uh, reflecting all the rays of the spectrum, the opposite of black. Uh, free from spot or blemish. Innocent, pure. Huh. Ain't this something without evil intent, harmless, honest, Square dealing and honorable. Wait a minute, but this 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 was written by white folks though, right? I mean, this white white folks book. This sure ain't no black man's book. So what are we reading this one for? Because the truth is lying there. If you read behind the words, you got to take everything the white man says and use it against him. Yeah. All right, wait, wait, I mean, you know, there's a whole lot of words in here. Aren't you? Here, let's start at the beginning. We'll look them up, write them down, and find out what they mean. Here. Page one, the first word, aardvark. Aardvark, earth pig, African ant-eating mammal, abacus, Chinese calculating instrument. Uh, Abaddon, the place of the lost in Sheol, the bottomless pit. If you take one step toward...
Okay, so our first question is, while Mal Malcolm was reading the dictionary, what words struck out to you when black and white were described? Um, I noticed that the contrast between black and white, white was described as innocent and pure, while black was described as like dishonor and foul. Um, for me, I think the words that stuck out the most was um, as the description of white as harmless and to be pure white and the opposite of black and honest. And then for black, um, he said the, um, like the bottom and bottomless. And I don't know, what really stuck out to me was the opposite of black and pure white, which I thought was kind of ironic considering the issues of today's society. I also uh, noticed how one of the words describing white was um, harmless, which I feel like um, if it's a white person who's writing the book, you know, um, they're kind of like creating the narrative. And I feel like in that, when they wrote harmless, they were trying to sort of um, like, absolve themselves of all like the history um you know like the violence um so i just i just thought that was um an interesting part um the word that stuck out to me was white as free from spots and black as dirty i find that very weird in a way because i don't understand how that concept was made, in a sense. One word that stuck out to me was when they said bottom, because, like, who really wants to be at the bottom? Everyone wants to strive for the top. It makes it seem like, oh, being a black is, like, a negative connotation. No one really wants to be that. So it's, like, that's kind of, like, edging to the second question, but, like, still, it makes it seem like being... Being black, like, black is just, just a bad thing that no one wants to be. Um, I thought it was interesting that black was described as void of color and white wasn't described as void of darkness. I think it kind of goes back to um, what we've actually talked about in African American studies about how people of color means it centers whiteness. And I think the definitions in this dictionary also centered whiteness because we don't call white people, people without color. We call them white people. So I just thought that was an interesting connection. Um, for me, uh, for black, it was hostile and white was pure. And I feel like it connects to how white women and black women are viewed in our society. And then I would just like to go back to what Naheem had said about the word harmless and the dictionary in the scene being written by a white man. It struck a thought that in today's society, we have a saying that we say white silence is violence. And so I think that having the white man had wrote the dictionary and described himself as harmless was in a way violence towards black people in itself because you're kind of excusing the real violence that happened, not even behind the scenes, that was happening at this time and throughout the civil rights movement, and you're kind of just excusing like slavery and the things that white people have put black people through, and so I just thought that was really um, intriguing. Who else? Mm -mm. To piggyback off what, I'm oh, sorry, to pick off what Miracle was saying, it was like, they think that what they did was like, they really, that's like a perfect way to show that white people thought they were absolute, like they were the, the upper race and they, they were the people when they're not. They were putting people into so much pain 
and no one really realized until he didn't even realize what the difference was until the guy pointed out in the dictionary that this has the meaning behind the text, like blurred lines, stuff like that. You know, um, I think you really triggered something because when you really think about it, we are all, language is powerful, and we all actually understand what, what words mean, even often without looking them up. So you understand all of the negative connotations that might be associated, let's say, with the word black, black male, black ball, all of these uh, um, negative uh, terms. And, um, and conversely, uh, certainly how a white is depicted very differently, pure as the driven snow and, and these sorts of things. So, so language is powerful and we actually get messages even from you know, the subtext in our subconscious, even if we're not thinking about it. So, you know, that really, you know, struck me and, um, you know, reminded me, you know, Brother Malcolm also said, of all of our studies, history is best qualified to reward our research. One of the reasons why, you know, I'm sharing that is that when it depicts uh, the term white means harmless. When you think of imperialism, colonialism, slavery, I don't actually get harmless. As a historian, I understand what manifest destiny means. All of these concepts which really are not harmless to indigenous people all over the planet. So there's a juxtaposition between what the term means according to white scholars and the actions of those who would be classified as those people. So you know, for me, I think that history is extremely important because even with the subtext of the uh, verbal violence, I think that occurs when, because if you just understand and study the English language, that is actually, there's marginalization even in the English language of black, the term black and black people. So it was extremely profound, but again, history will allow us to discern between what is fact and what is, in fact, fiction. Um, thank you. Thank you. For the sake of time, we're going to move on to the next film. And we kind of pretty much already answered the second question. Um, so we're moving on to All American. Amna, go ahead. Sorry. So All American is inspired by the true life story of NFL Super Bowl champion Spencer Paysinger. All American is an inspiring ensemble family drama about a young high school football school football phenomenon. Did I say it? My bad. Uh, Spencer. Sorry. Spencer James and the two families whose homes he shares after transferring from Crenshaw to Beverly Hills. His mother his, and his brother in sen South Central LA and the Bakers of Beverly Hills. But these two families and their vastly different worlds are drawn together. Spencer, the Bakers, and the James family will discover that the difference will divide us on the surface. A, sur on the surface, hide a deeper connection, the complicated, imperfect humanity that unites us all. Sanchez. Spencer James isn't a student at this school. It's not his place to speak. But I am a member of this community, sir. So that gives me every right. Go ahead, Mr. James. Two minutes. Please don't give up on South Crenshaw High, Miss Sanchez. Not yet. My mom's reminded me today that if we keep taking resources out of the neighborhood, if we keep diluting the legacies and memories created by this neighborhood, there's going to be no hood left standing. And look, I'm guilty of it too. 
I took a resource away from my neighborhood. And like Superintendent Carter, I thought I was doing it for all the right reasons, but I was wrong. I was wrong. Reinvesting in our community, reinvesting in us, in all of us, is the right choice. That's why I'm bringing back the resource I took away. What resource are you referring to? Me. I'm the resource. I'm one of the top 100 players in the country. Back on top of every recruiter's list, D1 schools will travel to see me play. That kind of national attention will attract even more resources and talent, not just to the school, but to the neighborhood, without pushing the load out. So as of this fall, I'll be re-enrolling as a student at South Crenshaw High. South Crenshaw deserves a shot at being great. I respectfully ask that y'all think long and hard about that before you cash your vote. And can you go to the first question real quick? The first question actually correlates to the first scene. I just want to go home. Thanks. So, um, in the first scene, in the first clip, Spencer describes himself as a resource that he wants to give back to his community. Why do you think Spencer, as one of the top athletes in this country who was attending one of the most prominent high schools for football, made the decision to re-enroll at Crenshaw High? Um, because since, you know, because he wants to bring like more attention to other people around him and like help other um, other students and like other players around him get the attention and his neighborhood get the attention that they need to and like just overall help them, you know, improve. Um, I think he recognized his impact on his community and what he his abilities can offer to others in his community. Because football is something Americans like or some Americans enjoy. And people who come out and sponsor um, the school or the football program come in and like watch the shows, pay for tickets, etc. And that would allow the school to be more to just like move it from where it is to a higher point. Like even today some places schools are given up on like some communities school don't have certain resources because of their location and because they have nothing not nothing to offer but because they have no resources they could be doing football or another sport that could same thing could happen what Spencer is doing but because of their position in each community they're not able to do that because they lack those resources. He also saw the value in himself and what he could, you know, bring to his community. If you look at college sports or even high school sports now, you have a lot of students that will travel hours to go outside of their community and not give, you know, that talent to their own community. If you look at like the Big Ten and those colleges, the majority of the players a lot of times on those fields are students of color. And if you've noticed, there has been a shift in, you know, college sports where a lot of these uh, top athletes are turning down these um, big Pac-10 schools and, you know, and going to HBCUs um, because why not give my talents to where it's really going to be valued because the minute I'm injured, I'm no longer good to you. I, I always tell students that you are a student athlete. You are a student first because, and I've always told my own personal children, you will not be a workhorse for any sports program. You're going to value your education first. And he saw the value in himself and in his community. To piggyback off of that, I think that Spencer, as, as Ms. Chavis said, found the value in himself. 
I think we were just talking yesterday about black athletes attending, like what the importance is to attend an HBCU over a PWI. Um, and as she said, I think once you go to a PWI as an athlete, you are almost nothing but an athlete to them. And once you get injured, opportunities, gone. Scholarship, gone. Because they don't care for you as an individual. Really what they want you to do is assimilate to the culture. And they want to use you just to get their rankings high and, you know, to increase diversity. But they don't care about you. So I think Spencer realized that within his community, with people who look like him and really valued who he was as a person, not just because he was an athlete, I think he realized that and chose to give back to his community. And then furthermore, who has watched the show before? And then, you know, you'll see like further in the show, he actually asked his coach from his new school to coach at South Crenshaw. And ironically, that coach attended South Crenshaw when he was younger. So not only was Spencer giving back to his community through him, but he was also influencing older generations his coach to come back and also help him to influence his community. To add on, I feel like that he realized that South Crenshaw and Beverly Hills are like literally the same thing. What can Beverly Hills like, like he is the product. He is, he is the, the athlete. He's not like, it's not like the school is giving him something to make him the best athlete out here. One of the top 100, it's him. He realized that himself, so he went to South Crenshaw. South Crenshaw and Beverly Hills are just two high schools that are different from race. That's the only thing that's different between them. So it's like what we talked about yesterday about HBCU saying that would you benefit more going to a PWI to get better, uh, better education when in reality it's the same exact education. It's just the differences in the communities and stuff like that. So I feel like he's going to he think that he can thrive and actually help the community as a black man in, and an athlete. You know, um, I just want to uh, chime in. Um, there was uh, one of one of my favorite authors, uh, Tony Bambara, uh, really spoke to this concept, uh, and she said uh, she was talking about artists, but I think it also uh, uh, applies to athletes. So I'm going to say it, and I think that you'll understand what I mean. She said that the duty of an artist or an athlete, in this case, representing an oppressed people is to create in them a spirit of revolution and make it irresistible. So if you have a particular skill set, a particular talent, then who are you setting up to benefit from said talent? And if your people are oppressed, then I think that her point was you have a moral obligation to try and level the playing field for your people who are marginalized and or oppressed. So for me, there are some things that are not for sale. I turned down a full scholarship to Franklin Pierce College when I was in high school and my mother thought I was crazy. But there were only 23, uh, 26 black people on campus at the time. And I said, absolutely not. She was like, baby, it's free. I said, I'm not for sale, mom. So what I understood you know, this quote, I mean, th that quote in, in this particular film clip, I've never seen this, but I'm going to start watching it this weekend. It's, it was so powerful. I'm so moved by his decision and because his decision actually mirrors many of the decisions that are now being made with the top athlete in the country in football deciding that he was going to attend Jackson State and many others are to follow because before white schools allowed black uh, um, athletes, um, all of the great black athletes were going to historically black colleges. And the only reason why they started allowing black people to go was not to benefit black people. For instance, in Alabama, uh, there was the coach Bear Bryant. He was getting the brakes beat off of him. He had vowed that he would never have any black athletes playing at the University of Alabama. So when they were getting thrashed by a team that had uh, a lot of black people on it, he said, quote, we're going to get us some. And now something that he did to win is a decision that many black people are making, taking their talents to these institutions that see them as cogs 
in their machine that generates millions and millions of dollars for these sports programs while HBCUs languish, although black lives have always mattered at HBCUs. So I, I see this as, as deep. It's about high school, but it's also about society in general. Thank you. So we're going to move on to our final scene. I just want to go home. Let's go. Come on. Come on. We need to see some ID. May I ask why? According to the owner of Pancho's, a person fit in your description was loitering and causing disorderly conduct. Loitering. You don't have to answer their questions, Fence. I've already committed their names and badge number to memory officers Bright and Whitner. A lot of gangs congregate in this area. Are you in one? Go stand next to Jordan, Dick. Go on. Look, the owner's straight profiled us, okay? We didn't do nothing wrong. But you did get into a fight in the store. An argument with my little brother doesn't mean I'm in a gang. It doesn't mean you are. Can we go now? Hey, watch your tone. Hey, this is unnecessary, officer. Step aside, son. This doesn't concern you. Now, I'm going to ask you one more time. Where's your ID? Wait, 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 Ever run. Come on, come on, let's go. No one's leaving until you finish answering our question. Your partner almost put a gun out on us. We either finish this here or we take this to the police. Look, man, can you please let my friend. So, to move into the discussion question. In this scene, Spencer experiences racial profiling at an ice cream slash yogurt shop. Was there anything in particular that the officer said that let you know, said or did, that let you know that this was an example of racial profiling? I'm gonna start off by saying that it was the way that that white officer, he had his hand on his gun when that little black kid ran up to him. What is that little black kid going to do to him? He's literally like, what, 14, 12? I mean, don't know how to work a gun. He don't know anything about society. He is still growing. He's pulled, he was trying to pull out his gun. That is great. These little kids are generation, sorry, our future generation. He's still pulling out guns. That's like, and the thing is, like the way he said, step aside to the, the what's his name? Connor? I don't know. He said step aside and stuff like that. It doesn't make it seem like, he, and the thing is, he didn't even do anything. He just basically had an argument, a talking argument. No one hands on each other, and he still was asking him questions. Are you in a gang? Da, 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 da. Why? Why is it always assumed that if you're arguing with someone, you're in a gang? But if it was a white person, that's a whole different story. I think, for example, right, because um, I watched the scene at home, it was like they were just arguing about yogurt with the little brother about something inside. And the female who was the owner or was working at that time was Caucasian. And it wasn't really of a big scene to call in the first place. Um, and she, the whole thing was like she was watching everything go by in the background. And she felt bad at the end. Like she, she was ashamed when she was the first one to call in the first place. Um, second of all, going back to what you said, I mean, just because you argue doesn't mean you're in a game. The first instinct was, oh, that doesn't mean that you're not in one. Why? Oh. Um, as a parent, seeing that, that kind of sent chills down my spine every time my oldest son or my middle son leave the house. When my oldest son got his driver's license and began to drive, um, you know, as his parents, I grew up in a different time and generation, of course, we had to have the conversation. If you get pulled over, you know, you comply, you say yes officer, you keep your hands in front, you don't ever resist, you keep your driver's license at the top of the visor 
so you don't have to reach. And, you know, seeing that, you know, I've experienced profiling as a black woman. I've been followed in stores. I've been asked for ID when five people in front of me in the line didn't have to show an ID. Um, you know, so all of that is things that I have seen and lived in, you know, still fear for my children because, you know, I, like I said, I have sons. And, you know, just any little thing, you know, you know, I could go on, but I won't. But I'm just saying, seeing that I've, I know exactly what they were going through, even though that was Hollywood. As a person of color, I know exactly where they were at. I mean, we've been profiled, you know, and pulled over as a family. You know, we don't have a, you know, a Maserati, but I mean, you know, we, you know, we're not balling, but I'm like, oh, you know, and it's the thought your tail light was out type thing. Like, okay, officer, whatever. So, I mean, you know, I completely understand where they're at. Um, I just wanted to say two things real quick. Uh, one, I used to live in Los Angeles, California, and I was racially profiled three different times by um, the L.A. County sheriffs. So depending on the city you live in, you have your city cops in, in L.A. County, but then you also have the L.A. County sheriffs. And depending on who stops you depends on who comes. So I think I, I was stopped once in L.A., and I was stopped twice in Pasadena. Uh, because um, prior to me growing out my hair, I always kept my hair real short. So from the back, it looked like I was a black male. And every time I was stopped, it was always for something that was ridiculously nonsense. Um, so that's that. But then, as I was getting dressed this morning, typical video, which is all over the internet now, where there was a, a white dude and, and a black dude, they're probably about high school age, middle school, middle school age, I believe. They literally were fighting at the mall. Kids fight. Cops get called right away. They tell the white kid to go sit down on this sofa. The black kid on the ground, face down, with, with in handcuffs, with knees from the white officer male and white officer female. Female police, literally a uh, policewoman, literally turned her back to the kid who was sitting on the sofa. Now that's 101. You don't turn your back on somebody you're, you're, you're talking to that might be in the altercation that might be able to um, hit you or harm you or whatever as a cop. Let the, let the white kid sit down. Black kid on the floor. It's all over the internet. And this just happens over and over and over and over again. Doesn't matter how old you are. All you got to be is a person of color. I would want to pose a question to the audience. We already know that profiling happened to black people. We know it happens all the time. We see it on the videos and things like that. My question to the audience is, what can you do about it? What if you see something happening to another human being that's not right, what is it that you can do about it? Before that question, I was gonna say something. Um, I think it's so sad to see that like at a very young age, like the kid didn't even know like what was going on. Like he's so confused. Like they have to learn at like age eight or like 10 that their skin color like is seen as a weapon like they have to learn how to like protect themselves against those people but like they're so young and like they just i feel like they just don't understand like i i don't know like it's so sad to see that they have to learn that stuff when they're really young And I think in the video where the little boy, where Spencer was telling the little boy he should not run, I think the reason that he didn't know that is because he grew up in Crenshaw. He didn't have to worry about that anymore, but when they came to L.A., it was a, in, an issue. So I feel like some people, depending on your area also, sometimes you don't have to worry about those things, and then you go into a new environment, a new community, and there are these people that you have to protect yourself from. You have to know, 
you can't get defensive. You have to comply. You have to just go along with it. Be, just be someone different or just be more, less hostile, I think. That's the word. Well, that's not the real word, but you get what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, so in one of the scenes, like, I'm pretty sure it was like the first season and it was like Jordan and Spencer, like they were driving at night and I'm pretty sure they were going home to like Los Angeles. Yeah. And then he got pulled over and then like Jordan, I guess like he wasn't really like, he didn't like really experience racism before, but Spencer like knew like you were like, you weren't like the protocol, quote unquote, and like what you're supposed to do and what not supposed to do you're not supposed to do so it was like kind of sad that like he didn't know what to do and then later his dad had to have a talk with him because like the police ended up coming I mean the police was there and they pulled him over and like I forgot what happened but I'm pretty sure like Jordan like was not complying he's like what did we do and it was because they're like in Los Angeles and they had like a nice car and it's it's sad that like he didn't know what to do and it's sad that like people have to get quote unquote trained to know what to do in that circumstance. Um hi. Um I'm gonna answer her question, what can we do about it? Um there's nothing we can actually do because yesterday I witnessed a situation that happened in my classroom. Um so this Caucasian boy and my African American teacher was having a conversation. We were doing work and it was just a cool conversation about school, and the Caucasian male called him out his name. Everybody knows the word, and being a black female teenager, I got triggered because why are you calling him that? And you know, I don't even know if he knows the history behind that word, but it was really sad, and I couldn't do nothing about it. I just walked out, I came back in, and nobody was just, nobody paid attention to him. He just said, Oh, my bad. I didn't mean to say it. And he apologized, but the apology doesn't mean anything. Why are you saying it? So my African-American teacher said, let it go. So I just, I can't do nothing about it. So yeah, that's what happened. Wow. Wow. Well, I wish we had more time to process. But listen, this has been a dynamic uh, uh, presentation. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, this is all something that we need to continue to reflect upon so that we can improve our society. Thank you to everyone. Thank you, teachers, uh, for taking time out of your busy schedule to bring your students down. Continue to support our Black History Month events.